welcome to the NBA Show Reviews and Discussion Podcast. I am your host, Norman Sanzo. Joining me today is Silver Quill. I have beheld the season 8, and it was good. Yes, it was really awesome. So, in today's discussion, we are going to talk about season 8 as a whole. What you like, what you dislike, you know, retrospective and whatnot. So, before we start, um, I- I'm gonna just put it out there and tell the audience that we're just going to be all over the place um, talking about things we like, characters and whatnot. So, um, it'll be a bit unfocused. What do you think, Silver? As opposed to our normal podcasts? Mm, normal podcasts seem focused, I guess, I hope. Well, I tend to de- I tend to just meander no matter what I do. Uh, but still, uh, it's all good. It's all good. We're all moving forward. True, 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 true. So, anywho, um, let's start it off with, what do you think of Season 8? I enjoyed it. I talked to a lot of folks and they seemed more frustrated than I. Mm. But, honestly, how to put this, I don't mean to sound derisive of anyone who holds the other view. Folks like to complain about the newest season, every time. Season 4, oh, what did they do? Season 5, oh, it's just... So bad. It's like you need to get another season or two under your belt, and then you look back more fondly on the old. We tend to celebrate the early seasons, even though they possessed multiple uh, quirks and flaws, just as these more recent seasons have. Sometimes I worry that nostalgia is blinding us. Mm-hmm. True that, true that. I, I, I got a friend who uh, kind of didn't want to watch season eight because of the whole school thing and how it was kind of a gimmick or a ploy to sell more toys and whatnot? Well, I, I have strong views on the uh, on the school and its impact on the characters. And since we're talking about the school, so why not start there? Like, it's a good place to start, right? School? Yes, it was the... Well, I wouldn't call it the central focus, but it's been a recurring theme throughout the season. So you, you have the floor, Silva. Oh, okay. Well, here's the thing. I like the students... In the School of Friendship. I, I greatly enjoyed the addition of Yona, Sandbar, Gallus, Ocellus, Smolder, and Silverstream. Because they were just a fun new dynamic. They were something fresh. And a, and an opportunity to exp- to flesh out the world more by having different representations of each uh, culture. However, as an opportunity for Twilight and Friends to become teachers, it was a disappointment. Very often, the main six are bad teachers we only get to see them when they're doing something terribly wrong the low point and my weakest episode for this season it was a non-compete clause where the incompetence of both applejack and rainbow nearly got one student killed and then twilight allows them to continue even though any teacher headmare with a lick of sense would say nope sorry but you had your chance and you threw it away i'm taking over this field trip Troy, i do remember that Here's the thing. This made me ponder, like I say, we see quirks in or flaws in previous episodes. And I've come to view this as an example of the void of positivity. It's where you're meant to assume that if it's not on screen, everything's going fine. And, you know, we only check in with the school every now and again. Now and again. Ergo. We assume that everything's just going hunky-dory when it's not on screen. Just like we assume Celestia's doing fine in Canterlot, or Cadence in the Crystal Empire, or any number of ponies that we've seen before but uh, have not made a return. We assume they're doing well. And so when we uh, check back in and see that they're performing (laughs) rather subpar, then we start to think, well, if that's the only information available, we assume that they're just bad at their jobs. True that, true that, and I, I guess it's one of those scenarios where, um, as the audience, as a viewer of the show, we just get to watch what we are presented with. I mean, it's kind of strange for us to say, "Oh, um, there's something beyond," or like normally it won't be like this because, hey, um, it's not going to be chaos all the time, right? And when you Look at it that way, like, think about it that way, like, hmm, we are so invested in this world or universe where 
we can imagine or we can see them having a normal day. And when when we watch the show, it's all chaos. Chaos and carnage. Although chaos is fun to watch, just mm-hmm. as Discord. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's just one of the scenarios. Well, I'd say the most positive display for Twilight and Friends as teachers was in Marks for Effort, where the Cutie Mark Crusaders watched successful classes being carried out. And then uh, the Hearthwarming Club, where Twilight was seen to be tapping into the same energy as Celestia as a teacher to let them figure things out and solve their own problems, even though she was on top of it. Mm -hmm. However, these two episodes also form a contrast. Uh, Twilight immediately assumes the Crusaders are guilty without hearing them out, yet is far more patient with uh, Gallus and company. Then you would say that she learned her lesson. One one could hope. But As is... people have pointed out, there's always the risk of regression in this show, which is also, well, people regress. It's natural to, to take one step forward and one step back sometimes. Mm-hmm. True, true. But at the same time, too, um, we got no idea what's the time span for the episode or season. Sorry, yeah, the episodes, because... Uh, we assume that one episode is equivalent to a month. And I think that theory came up when we get the non-complete plus where Fluttershy got, um, what, how many um, teachers of the month award did she got? It's quite a lot, right? She had, she had nine and it was the ninth episode. Yeah, so um, it was like um, one episode... Uh, it's equivalent to a month but <laughs> I have to point something out because school days part 1 and 2 is considered one day uh, well at least two days I mean Twilight is in bed eh, true, and true. D- dawn has broken truthfully this was even an argument uh, that came up at BabsCon how do you tell chron- uh, chronological order in this show when you know, Celestia says it's been a year since Nightmare Moon was defeated and Luna returned, but there have been several winters displayed in the show. Basically, your head is going to explode if you try and uh, actually map the time. Yeah, but at the same time, too, what I'm about to say doesn't sound fair, but um, earlier episodes don't really keep that in mind anymore. Like, they, they don't keep those things in mind. So, because, what, um, season one, who really pays attention to this? And the only people or the yeah the only people who are going to watch this are kids ladies and gentlemen meet the bronies they think <laughs> they think yep. also consider this within your average school nine months would be a full academic year or close to this is if you're following the um north american way of studying because in malaysia if i do remember right we don't have that much of a holiday. Um, I think we only get a month off on December, while mm-hmm. we get um two weeks. And th- there's a give and take of um how much time off we have, but we we won't have three months off. Well, this is America, son, North America. Well, and you can't spell North America without America. <laughs> but I'm just saying. I'm just saying. But um, getting back on track, um, yeah, school. Yeah, you you mentioned the school we face up and down. Like for me, I, I like the school setting because it shows that um dynamic where they're trying to do something new that's out of the norm. But before I go there, personally for me, uh, for season seven, I would like I would have thought that they would have gone for Starlight and her crew, and we get to see them grow uh, in character because uh, like you mentioned before you like the addition of the student six and what they do because it's a new dynamic for the show and whatnot i felt that in season seven for starlight because when we saw star what was it the first episode where starlight and trixie were hanging out and they have that awesome song no 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 that was the beginning of it all built up that was part two yeah, uh, Road to Friendship was a little bit longer. 
sorry, um, all bottled up. Like, um, Road to Friendship was season eight. Now, um, what I'm just saying is here, is that I felt that um, the show was was leaning to Starlight and Friends. So we have that new dynamic where, oh, um, we'll we can have the same lesson being told to us again, but via Starlight and her perspective and how she handles things. But oh no, it's just the same Twilight and Friends kind of adventure story. And with this season eight, it's similar to where it's Twilight and Friends with their adventures and story. As much as I celebrate additions to the show, I never want them to forget the main cast. True that, true that. Here's just an example. People complain, oh, Starlight stole the show from Twilight and Friends. Oh, the, the or oh, the student six are, are taking away w- when we want these characters. When I was growing up, there was this show Silverhawks, where it was a sort of an advent- action adventure. Anytime they introduced new characters, the rest of the cast disappeared for good. Wow. I mean, th- they were there theoretically, but by and large, they were either just one scene cameos or just never seen at all. And it just kept going that way as they introduced more new characters. So when people complain, oh, Twilight has no role anymore, it's like, guys, I'm sorry, my experience is you have no idea how far that can go. And this is not nearly so bad. True, true. But mm, I don't know. I mean, with Starlight, I felt like it would be best if they shift perspective to Starlight and friends. But then you'll have them haters hating. And I don't know, man. Like, I, I felt that way. Like, I felt like it's time for the... What's the phrase? The passing of the baton? Passing of the guard? Something like that? Passing the torch? Yes, thank you. Passing the torch. But you do have your point. Like, if you do that, it was too strong of a shift where people will hate it. And with the students here, I felt like it was the right amount of introducing the new characters and putting them in episodes. Like, having them uh, lead the season finale was kind of cool too. We also got to check in on some characters. When we saw Rock Hoof in a Hard Place, I thought it would just be Rock Hoof, but it was really an update on all the pillars. True, true. That, that was a kind of cool uh, backstory for them. And we also got to expand the world, which I greatly enjoyed. Let's see here. What did we have? We got to see more of Las Pegasus and Granny's Gone Wild, still the creepiest title of the entire series. <laughs> yeah. And also we get to see... Um, Las Vegas is in another light. Um, it's township and whatnot in Friendship University. Ah, uh, yes, where Flim and Flam just show they have no self control. They have to run a scam. Uh, let's see. And then there's Surf and or Turf, where we got to see hippogriffs post Storm King. So they actually have, you know, they have a more bustling city both above and below the waves. Oh yeah. And of course, I'd argue this is the most popular episode. Uh, the sounds of silence. Oh, okay. Um, sound of silence has its um reasons, but here's the thing. I, I oh, mm, do I want to do this now? You know what? You you forced my hand into this. Um, what's your favorite season eight episode? Um, I, I'll let's just say you have five to pick from in no particular order. Oh, yeah, why don't we pick five? Well, sounds of silence is easily my favorite of the of the season. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's say Sounds of Silence, Heartwarming Club. Uh, let's see here. What else was fun? Parent Map was pretty fun too. And let's see, let's see, let's see. Uh, horseplay? No. Horseplay. I put that at number five, and number four. Figure till we make it. No, no, no. I I enjoy I enjoy Fluttershy, but that one had a few extra issues that. The washouts. The washouts. I like seeing the return of lightning dust, and I like seeing Scootaloo face her, except that she may never fly. Ah, all right, all right. Personally, for me, uh, my five episodes for season eight would be, in no particular order, by the way, would be um, Fake It Till You Make It, because I just love seeing Shy 
being other thing than Fluttershy, like uh, tone shift and whatnot. Like that, that just kick, gives me a kick. And horseplay, because we get to see Celestia acting. Like we get to see Celestia in a slice of life role, which is really cool. Then, uh, let's see, let's see. Heartwarming Club, because it was fun. We, we get to see backstory of the students. Really cool. Ah, Friendship You. F you. <laughs> and, oh man. I'm going to cheat and say On the Road to Friendship and also Sound of Silence. The Sounds of Silence. Okay, I got that out of my system. <laughs> and those two are just because of the songs. There's a lot of good episodes here to break down. But, Silver, um, with the good comes the bad. Which, episode, which, which, which one do you dislike a lot? I mean, you can pick as much as you want, but I have one that I really, really don't like. Well, for me, it's no question non-compete clause. Really? In fact, it's amazing. It's amazing the lasting impact because the same writer uh, tackled two shorts, all of them dealing with uh, teacher of the month. There's or a competition between Applejack and Rainbow Dash. Uh, there was the there was the short of the Double Dares, which I thought was fun and silly. And really didn't have a negative impact on the public besides Rainbow cutting in line. But because it reminded everyone of non-compete clause. Oh boy, they did not like that. Oh really, no. That bad. Same with the short about uh, about trying to become Teacher of the Month with Fluttershy. Uh, people just railed on that because, again, non-compete clause showed everyone except the student six at their worst. And it just fell apart. Oh, really? No. Like, I, I personally don't mind on Compete Clause because it's just Rainbow Dash and Applejack being silly. And nearly getting Yona drowned. I mean, Yona, good lord, tell me they signed a permission slip for her to even attend, period. Because otherwise, uh, she. how many times has she nearly died now? Um, Drowning, falling from the sky, two, two, two times. Oh, wait, uh, if you're going to count School Race Part 2, um, being sucked into a vortex of unknowns, so that's three. And attacked by the Pugwallies, that's four. Oh, yeah, four, yeah. And let's see here. Uh, would we count Celestia's dropping them from a uh, the stage? That could have risked at least injury. Nah, that, that one was um, stage play and stuff like that. Nah, I won't count that. As... Oh, oh, oh you, you're, you're gonna, next you're going to tell me that wrestlers can't get hurt because it's scripted. <gasps> What are you talking about, man? Oh, I've shattered Norman's delusions. <laughs> well, yep. Re wrestling is scripted and they don't get health care. That's messed up. Yeah, that's true. That's true. That is messed anyway, up. Anyway, uh, let's see here. What else was... You know, I felt a little awkward after the mean six. It wasn't a bad episode, but I felt bad that one, Fluttershy is still on the outs with all the creatures of the forest due to something she didn't do, and no one communicated. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I just have to say this. Um, Master of Lag, Patreon supporter, talked to me about it, and Fluttershy never learned her lesson. That And that lesson is never split from the party. She did this twice, one in the mean six, and the other is Sounds of Silence. Well, I mean, there you had to divide and conquer. Not really. Yeah, I mean, she had to stay behind and try and work things out while Applejack sought out the Chetty Kieran. No, no, no. At the very beginning, where um, Applejack was, Applejack was jumping from place to place just to get to the Kieran village, and when she looked behind, oh, she's not there. Oh God, where is she? So she had to go back. Ah, uh, well, that one could argue that was Applejack splitting the party as she charged ahead without looking back. <laughs> Probably. But, um, so, there you go. Basically, they're not good D&Ders. <laughs> yes. Even though an upcoming comic issue will feature them LARPing. Oh, God. I can't wait. Yay. Anyway, um, um, sorry. Uh, you Lark. say non complete cause is one of them. Um, the mean six? No? Yes? Maybe? Well, it left a weird feeling afterwards, but I wouldn't call it a bad episode. If anything, I, I enjoyed seeing Chrysalis have her plan fall to pieces. And just seeing how much her sanity has degraded since she lost her 
her hive. Oh, yeah, that is true. That is true. Honestly, there weren't a lot of bad episodes at all. There were just some that you felt like, eh, that was fine, but it could have been better. Mm, all right, all right. And as for me, I have two. Um, I, I, I think you know one of them. And the first one is Yakety Sack. That episode infuriates me. It's okay. I, I understand. Um, do the things you love because you love it, no matter if you're good or bad. I, I get the lesson. The thing mm -hmm. about it that irks me is that know your limit because even though you love doing the things that you do, you should respect other people's time, privacy, whatever it is, because Pinky played the uh what was it, the Zuvela? The Uvidaphone. The the yeah, the Uvidaphone during at the night when creatures were about to sleep at oh man, like it just irks me. Like Pinky doesn't know her limits and ah uh, and the nerve of her lashing out on her friend saying that uh you don't want me to play because yeah, I feel sad. Like mm, that's one. The others, like I'm not hundred percent sure if I'm angry because of the episode or the character. And that is, father knows best. I I, I stated my problem with this one a while back, but I'll just um, rehash it here. And that is, I hate Sludge. Sludge doing that to Spike, like. Uh, and the potential of the story and whatnot, and I I, I think what um we we came to a underst to understanding where um the character or the intent or something like that was it. I think we acknowledge that you're supposed to not like Sludge. That if you make it if he makes you angry, that means he's done his job effectively. Mm -hmm. That's true. That's true. And I, I do like the um, head cannon thing. <laughs> that was really awesome. For me, it's those two, man. Like, I, 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 no, no, not those two. Never those two. Never again. Yeah. But, but you, you say non compete clause was bad. Now, I, I find that hi highly entertaining. Well, see, it's funny. I, I like, uh, well, okay. I agree with you on a lot of cri criticisms of Yakity Sex, especially Pinky's behavior and presentation. I still think her friends did a lousy job critiquing her, but that's that's a different topic. What I liked about Yakety Sax is that between Yona and the Yaks in Yakety Sax, my appreciation for the Yaks has tripled. <laughs> uh, they were the worst part of the world for me for a while, but now I realize it's just Rutherford. We just have to destroy Rutherford. I'm calling for a Griffin... Uh, well, no, I'm calling for a yak coup and a hippogriff coup while we're at it. I still think uh, you can do better than Queen Novo. Oh, wow. So, coup all around. Who who wants to topple some governments, eh? Hey? Hey? <laughs> no, you don't want to see that. Ah, oh, boys. But, yeah, anywho, um, what, what are we missing here? What are we missing here? So, um, we, we talked about the school. We talked about the... No, I, I think we're missing the students. We didn't talk about them that much we just talk them in passing so the students what do you think man like they are the newest addition to the show um they're what there's something like introducing the new main six which was kind of a shock to me because they're doing this and they're adding male leads which is kind of cool and different species wow i did feel kind of bad Full disclosure, I did check out the leaked assets when uh, they were first made online because if I don't, people usually ask me about them anyway. Mm -hmm. And I, so I figure I might as well at least see them and have my own first reaction rather than having it spoiled. Mm -hmm. And I felt bad because when I listened to Smolder during the Meltdown, I, with the attitude and the posing and all that, I assumed Smolder was male. Oh, really? No. It wasn't until later that I lo I learned, oh, well, that that probably says more about my assumptions. But the voice thing, like, 
yeah, it's a little deeper, a little scratchier, but still you could interpret it as male or female. Mm, ah, yes, I see. But Smolder became the most fun when you realize that she does actually like some frilly things and doesn't mind dressing up. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, Ocellus, in my eyes, was just adorable. Okay, I'm a Fluttershy fan. I see a lot of I see a lot of similarities with Ocellus, but she's got a blend of Twilight's knowledge as well. And like I said, Yona made me feel better about the yaks in general. I'm tempted. I'm tempted to have my character just take a pair of clippers into yak yakistan <laughs> and take a little off the front so we can see their eyes. <laughs> Don't hug them till you see the whites of their eyes. <laughs> oh no. And uh, let's see here, Gallus. He became everybody's. Uh, I think he became a favorite after the Heartwarming Club, where you learned that life was really hard for him. And there's nothing like realizing a character hasn't had it easy that to really invoke some sympathy. But I will maintain he needs education in the proper operation of doors. That shameful display in school rays. It's a push door, Gallus. If it was pulled to close, it's pushed open. <laughs> I'm so confused. Uh boys. But no, um yeah. <sighs> Did you say anything about Sandbar? Who's Sandbar? <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm sorry, but for Sandbar, he... Honestly, I feel like what we've seen in Season 9 has given him a better characterization than Season 8. Season 9, he was just sort of the median, the middle ground between all the other students. He was the calming influence, but he was also... Uh, how to... But this, he's so mellow and easy going, it's hard to spot a conflict with him. Yeah, you mean season eight, right? It's, yeah, season eight. I'm jumping ahead to season nine. But season nine has shown him to be more oblivious. He's so laid back that perhaps his awareness suffers. Plus, I always scratch my head why he blamed Ocellus in Hearts Warming Club. He's so chill and mellow that blaming other creatures doesn't seem like him. We do see that he cracks under duress. I mean, <laughs> he was so twitchy at the school days, part two, where he was trying to get cupcakes for his hiding friends. <laughs> yeah. And then he freaks out when they're about to hit a rock while on a raft. Totally understandable. And even shouting about Cozy Glow. But that made it more important when, uh, in What Lies Beneath, where he was, he gave up on his hero worship because he stood by genuine friends i think he took uh the lesson of heartswarming club to heart mm. pun intended true, true 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 and yeah i mean the student six here are they they're not a direct carbon copy of the main six i feel like or i feel and i see that the student six here are really awesome because first things first they're different species altogether like except for the Except for Sandbar, who is a pony, but you have a bunch of other creatures. Like, you have a yak, dragon, changeling, hippogriff, and griffin. Like, this is what we kind of want, diversity in the group. And that's all good. I really enjoy that because when with diversity, you get um, different cultures and whatnot. And we see a bit of that in... Uh, the Heartswarming Club. And with characters like um, Ocellus, we get to see how the Changeling are after their um, transformation from Black Changeling to Multicolor Rainbow Changelings. We, we get to see how they are, how they evolve. Would you say it's true? Or am I wrong here? Because we did see that with Starlight and Trixie. Oh, no, we get to see how they've evolved. We get to see how literal-minded they are, which was one of the most delightful parts of uh, the Heartswarming Club. Yeah, true, 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 true. So uh, it, it's fun to see them, basically, they're almost building a culture or reinventing almost from scratch. Yeah, I mean, they don't have anything that's their own besides, well, they're, they're a culture of copies. Like, they invade via going in deep by uh, what's the word i'm looking for infiltrators infiltrators yes but uh the remember in um captain marvel that race what was that called again oh the the scrolls yeah the scrolls yeah the, like literally being the scrolls getting in there and stuff like 
yeah, that's them. But now, what they do here, they discover their own thing, they try to build their own civilization and whatnot, and it's going slowly for them, and it seems like it's working for them. Yona's cool, and I, I think there's not much to say about the yaks, except they like to smash. And I don't know what to say, man. Like, they're there, and they like to smash. <laughs> well, but we actually learned that one, we get to see their, uh, how to put it, coming of age ceremony where they braid Yona's hair. That was nice. And again, I'm jumping ahead to season nine, but even the smashing has a, a greater philosophical perspective, mm. which is like, oh, God, I'm starting to like the yaks. Help me. <laughs> no, Silver. You have to accept them. I can accept them if they depose Rutherford. <laughs> and Yak Yak is libre. Free them. Down with the tyrants. <laughs> Attica. Attica. And Smolder is just awesome. Like, um, at first, she plays that, oh, um, tomboyish character. Um, I hate the flirty. Like, you, she doesn't say it out loud, but she's not into flirty, girly tea stuff and whatnot. Because she's a dragon. She's badass. She breathes fire and she has to be cool and whatnot. Like, grr. Then, in uh, what was it again? What lies beneath? She likes all those cute, cute stuff like tea parties, wearing dress, flurry, flurry dress, and whatnot. Like she loved it, and that is a very awesome development. Like, oh wow, man! Well, that does raise a question, though. Uh, this has more to do with Gallus and, and Smolder. I do take issue when the show presents it that a culture is just. Bad dragons naturally like seeing small, weak things get punished, and griffins are naturally greedy. And I just like you know that's how do I put this? It's like saying your your race or species or whatever determines your attitude. And I just feel like that's a very dangerous oversimplification. But I'll put this spin on it, Silver. Like probably it's their culture instead of their species and whatnot. It could be their culture. Because if you want to take a look, see at the dragons in San Francisco. What was it called again? San Francisco? Uh, I'm forgetting. You mean the dragons in Philadelphia? Yes, Philadelphia. In yeah. Drag Dragon Town? Yeah. Well, I don't know I don't know if time has has forgiven or uh been gentle to that uh comic issue. But Norman I, I could buy into it, there's a culture, but how many cultures really stress hack, uh, shaking someone down for money or stealing as a, as a genuine virtue or something to be encouraged? The, I, if it was like dragons value strength, okay, and you could you could say that the uh, that the ruler who lost her scepter in uh in smolder story was weak she, she was careless with her power okay there's a better lesson but they phrase it as now we just like seeing uh other creatures suffer see th there's a difference true but you could also view it as smolder not really learning the lesson or the moral of the story because um one could say that um the story of uh, the boy who cried wolf, he cried wolf a lot that people don't believe him. And one would say the lesson to take from there is don't lie because when a real threat comes, nobody going to come and help you. That's how the lesson is, right? So, Or if you ask uh, Garrick from DS9, uh, don't tell the same lie twice. <laughs> yes, that's also true. I agree with you that there's, it depends on how you interpret the story or tell it to others. But then we suffer from the fact that there's no uh, dragon to add a counter view. That's why Father's Nose Beast, I like that Smolder and Sludge offer different takes on what it really means to be a dragon. But again, I wish we could see a little bit more interplay of that and not reduce these uh, species to just one vice. True, Dad, but that, I'm, I'm just saying because. For me personally, I feel that the thing about um, creatures and their, what you call this, 
um, vice and whatnot. To me, that could be culture because sometimes their culture is quote unquote holding them back from doing stuffs and whatnot. Like you mentioned before, griffins are naturally greedy. Are they really? Because I don't see that with Gilda. Oh, she well, she had her own uh, attitude problems. But you know that they say always share the bits. True, true. No, but I'm just saying because um, it's true that we saw that in Griffinstone, Griffins are kind of money grubbing jerks. But there's a reason to it because they live in the dump and they want to get out of there as soon as possible. Again, I find that to be a very dangerous mindset because you. I think you could hear people say that about real world. Uh, cultures mm, true again i just see a lot of danger in accepting or even promoting that it's like you live in an area that's hard to live in okay what could be done to improve it not just oh they they're oh they're all like that because they want to leave their awful place and come live in our awesome place yeah. that's what the immigrants did when they first moved to america little known fact most americans are the descendants of immigrants hey. And yet we tend to forget that. (laughs) But to say that a culture is inherently inferior or vice-driven or that they just want to get out of that awful place uh, and never go back, you know, some immigrants do send money back to their families. That's their, how they help. True that, true that. But but, I mean, let's not get um, too real worldies and let's keep to the ponies and whatnot. But for me personally, I don't really see that. I mean, the show kind of, shows that with the Griffins. Okay, let's just take Griffins, for example, for a bit. The Griffins are jerks. Why? Because who knows? Reasons. Like, they're greedy. Really? They are, I mean, there's a lot of things that people could say, or you know, there's a lot of things that could be extracted from the episodes that were shown about the Griffins, but I don't feel it that way. I mean, it's just opportunities, something like that. That's how I feel. Like they just want to earn better and just do something with their lives. Well, it ultimately it comes down. You could rephrase it. Griffins have an inherent appreciation of gold. Mm, true, true. Which means they could. You could present them as beautiful crafts workers with the material, or very artistic. It didn't have to be. Uh, they're just greedy. Like I said, I feel that that's reducing a culture down to a single vice rather than exploring a core premise. True. Gax values strength. Okay. Dragons value strength as well. But do you have to show them running around breaking stuff or threatening to burn the countryside? (laughs) That's, uh, yeah, a questionable presentation. As they burn through cottages! No, but... Cottages! (laughs) But uh, I I don't know. I mean, it depends on the writer at the moment because if we take a look, see at ah, man, th- this is a hard discussion to talk because it's going beyond characters. It's just going it's going to things that are presented to us, but we don't have the full info here to say what's right and wrong. Well, but sadly, we won't get more info. Is my concern? Uh, yeah, true that. I, I I don't know, man. Like I feel like. The Yaks have a society where they are, well, they, they smash stuff, that's one. But beyond that, they have their culture where they're considered to be normal, besides the smashing. And dragons, on the other hand, I, I don't see much of them. What we do know is that when the changing of the garbs, they have this event called uh what was it in dragon race something like that what the gauntlet of fire yes thank you yeah gauntlet of fire so they have that and so on like i mean those are the few things that we see and know but other than that eh, not much well and we may not know more but i i'll stick by my assertion you shouldn't define a uh, group only by its vices. Mm, true that, true that. That I can agree on. That I can agree on. But then that's also why I'm grateful for Smolder and Gallus and Yona and the others. I mean, uh, hippogriffs aren't very well defined, but they, they've been pretty 
amicable except for Queen Nova. Again, call, calling for a coup. <laughs> calling for a coup. Yeah, but no, um, hippogriffs are kind of confusing at the same time, too. And What? What? What do you mean? What do you mean confusing? Uh, I'm perfectly reasonable. <laughs> wee, wee, wee. <laughs> no, I mean, I think Applejack summit, right? Because they have a navy. Why they want a ship? They can change into sea ponies. I need a ship. Oh, there's lots of reasons. If you import or export goods, you need a means of transport carrying heavier weight than maybe one sea pony can allow. True, true. If you need to go into conflict, you're going to need more than for, I guess, what would the term be for foot soldiers who can swim? Fin soldiers? Yes, fin soldiers. You need more than fin soldiers to fight a war. Oh. <laughs> you, you need a mobile base. That's what a ship can serve as. All right, all right. And so on and so forth. There's plenty of logistical reasons, though it is kind of funny. Applejack has a right to ask that question, but there are very logistical answers. Yeah, true, that, true, that. Like shipping those apples. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, she should be working on expanding her market. Hey, y'all, you want to buy some apples? <laughs> apples, apples, apples. Oh, boy. Yeah, true, that, true, that, true, that. And, yeah, I don't know. I mean, the Student Six are awesome characters. I, I won't say that they're well defined but they have character and character quirks you, it makes you want to watch them more and want to know more and jumping ahead of time a bit um we know that silverstream is an amazing artist oh well, she certainly has great love for color of course because of uh what lies beneath ship her and gal gal is something awful oh yeah 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 yeah, yeah. i ship it yeah 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 Oh, man. And also, what, Sandbar and Yona? I can dig it. I can dig it. I guess just by virtue of being the last pair remaining, it's Ocellus and Smolder. Huzzah! Yeah. Kind of, because, what, um, Smolder confessed to Ocellus about her love for quick, uh, cute, furry stuff. Although I I haven't heard you that excited for shipping since uh, Bayonetta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, man. Uh, I'm not feeling too well, so I, I, I can't go overboard, but yeah, yeah. Okay, um, what else do you want to talk about, Silver? I think we talk about the school, the students, uh, favorite episode, dislike episode. Villains? Villains, yes. Yeah, oh wow, how could I forget? Oh man, the villain for this episode. What? Well, it's villains for the season, I guess. Yeah. I mean... Naysay really, they really pushed Naysay as the lead antagonist. True, true. And you could see him abusing his power in the, uh, in uh, Friendship University where he gave full accreditation to a pair of, uh, a scam while he was so hesitant with Twilight. All because, again, there's the, in some ways I could understand if he's patriotism taken to a dangerous extreme. Yeah, okay, here's the thing. Bronies react. I got the chance to take part in that. And in the comments, people were asking why some of us uh, wanted to know the reason behind uh, Nese's speciesism. Uh, arguing that, well, he, it doesn't make him, it doesn't make it okay, which I agree. But understanding why someone makes a bad mistake is just as important in my eyes as understanding that what, that the mistake was wrong. Because here's the thing. You could say, oh, don't do that. Okay, I won't do that. <laughs> then you make another mistake for the same motivations. It's like uh, tor if you tell someone the story of the tortoise and the hare, what, it what is it really about? It's about a very slow tortoise who wins the race because the hare was distracted by a very sexy bunny. Dude, what story have you been reading? I got no idea, man. Why are you trying to lose this up? We're were you reading the Beniri version of this or something? Probably. They're way too young. Oh, great. A, fur a furry's guide to the tortoise and the hare. Good, good gravy, Norman. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, well, we still haven't reviewed Ladybug yet, so we need that sick thing. All right? uh, oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I've given him ideas. Now, for me, the tortoise and the hare, there is the moral of uh, patience and hard work wins mm -hmm. the race. But there's also a warning against pride and uh, arrogance mm -hmm. on the hair's part. It's not just, oh, 
don't delay in a race, that's a rather limited lesson, it's beware becoming haughty or uh, too proud of your abilities that they undermine you. Mm -hmm. See, that's the lesson, the real lesson. By a similar notion, you can certainly just say racism is bad, okay? <laughs> but understanding the human element, the the vulnerabilities that drive that mindset, that leave one open to this mindset, that's also something worth being on guard against. I'd like to think that Naysay, when he was exposed to a his first impression of the world might have been the Storm King's invasion. I'll go way back from the Storm King, and it could be the Changeling invasion. All right. Fair. Good point. So the Changelings invaded, the Storm King invaded. Uh, maybe not a lot of interaction with other species, especially since the EEA doesn't, isn't catering towards those groups. He might only view the world as a threat. And it's very tempting that when you've been hurt to view the world only in terms of threats. But then it also shows how that can hurt you. So that would be a valuable lesson. And I think kids would benefit from that. That's why people want to know why Naysay is the way he is. Not so they can excuse or justify his actions, but understand the vulnerability that, that uh, gave rise to them. Yeah, that, that's true. That's true. Because here's the thing. Um, I always question, why is Naysay such a jerk? Because... Equestria is not squeaky clean, that's for sure, because we remember way back when, uh, I think season two, where the cherry salesman was a big jerk to Fluttershy. Yeah, from that point on, we're told that Equestria is not squeaky clean. Flame and Flame is another example, and so on. And what else? Uh, yeah, so there's always going to be some flaw to the universe. Even in what, the comics, where uh, issue 75, was it? Well, no, 65. Are we are we on 65, by the way? Uh, I need to double check. It's easy uh, to yes, get lost uh, sorry. because we've... we are on 64, going to 65, and 65 is awesome. And that is Celestia's Days Out. <laughs> uh, that was 65. Well, we'll, I'm sure we'll tackle that in due yeah, course. But in that, in that comic, we, we have some pony riffraffs who steal stuff. So, yeah. The, the world is not perfect, that's for sure. And Naysay here is just doing the best he can to protect it from threats. Unfortunately for him, his ideology for protecting those threats are being a dumb racist. Yeah, I like DWK's version of him. Much more funny and creepy. Where he's... Where he's basically uh, Frollo from uh, The Hunchback of Notre Dame. Kind of. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, why not? But uh, yeah, um, knowing thy enemy is awesome. But talking about enemies, right? We, we, we hinted at it before, and let's get into it now. Cozy. What? Well, Cozy, I mean, you know, the minute she starts talking, it feels like something that you would script. And I think that's intentional. She knows what to say. But she's way, way too proper and formal for to be just a kid. Or at least an average kid. So you knew something was up with her right away. Oh, yeah, that's true. And it's always there. I think the funniest was that uh, French, at the end of Friendship University, like, who could have given Flim and Flamar books? And then Cozy Glowing. <laughs> yeah. like, wow. Subtle, y'all. I'm just thinking about Cozy here. Um, and you know what? It could be her, and that could be done as a distraction to do stuff. Wait, I'm just taking a look see. Uh, when was the Matter of Principle episode? Oh my god. What? Um. Okay, Matter well, of Principle is episode 14. Friendship with you is episode 16. So... Well, the, Cozy wasn't in uh, Matter of Principle. Yep, I know, but the thing is, uh, Matter of Principle is the episode where uh, all of the artifacts are around the school for them to do a treasure hunt. Uh, Friendship You is the episode where Twilight is off gallivanting. But if I'm not mistaken, uh, 
the N in friends, did they use an artifact? From Yes, the Aurora amulet. But that's not part of the uh, exchange, right? Well, it is. It's uh, it's how Twilight... You know, I probably should have added uh, the end in friend to my lesser liked episodes. It was not a... It was an interesting idea, but I felt like it came too late in the series. But they do, Twilight does say the Aurora amulet has been stolen so she can get uh, Rainbow Dash and Rarity to mend their friendship. Hmm. Uh, but I also should correct myself... I think Cozy was in A Matter of Principles as a character in the background uh, or just attending class with the others mm. at the start. Let's see here. A Matter of Principles. I'm going to check out the gallery, oh, see if I can spot Yeah, it. no, no. My, my, my theory, what, what I was trying to say was um, A Matter of Principles happened and then Cozy Glow sent off uh, her copy of the book to Flame and Flame to start off Friendship U and while Twilight is gone she had access to the uh, artifact to well do what she need but that kind of debunks my theory because um, one episode later the end in Friends it's all there so nah and uh, she is Cozy is sitting right next to Gallus and Silverstream uh, at the start of Matter of Principles. So that's where she likely learned about all the anime, uh, all the magical artifacts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in some ways, I, I like Cozy for the fact that her plan is not uh, determined at the start. She Her first step, get into the School of Friendship. Second step, it, I'll figure it out when I'm in the School of Friendship. Third step, profit. In some ways, <laughs> third step, profit. She, oh, Empress. Yeah, third step, Empress. Uh, but I do kind of like that she adapts on the fly, and it's not everything has gone as I've planned. It's that I've taken advantage of what's there hmm. to get ahead. But it, but you have to question her logic in this, because why, okay, you're in school. Why jeopardize that by failing and getting kicked out? Well, she needed to get on Twilight's radar. So you have to fall into conflict before you can be uh, here's the terrible truth if you're just good at what you do and you maintain steady people won't really take note of you as much as they will someone who's a sharp sporadic uh dissonance and that's unfortunate it's why like what was the little old adage a guy who goes to work uh nine to five every day and is never late gets chewed out more than a slacker who's never puts in a full work Oh, man. Because people just sort of take that hard work for granted. So I think Cozy knows this, and that's why she's causing a stir, just so to make sure she's noticed. Now, I do agree that she is a, has a terrible lack of logic on one key principle. She doesn't acknowledge that she's a kid, and no one is just going to turn over power to a kid. She needed a puppet. And, sit puppet was and she never developed one. Well, she made everyone her puppets in that uh, they did what she wanted to get her into a position where she could try to take power. But to get people to listen to her, get ponies, uh, she needed someone to be sort of her voice box. Mm, true, 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 true. No, I mean, okay, here's the thing. Like, I, I see what you mean about creating conflict just to be on the radar. And it's true because I'm just thinking about it this way. Cozy's plan was kind of ingenious when you think about it, really. She's in school, but... She doesn't stand out besides her look and whatnot. I mean, yeah, whatever. But using the CMCs to gain access or just to get noticed by Twilight and the rest is very devious, especially creating conflict between the CMCs. Like, what? Why CMCs out of all the rest? Because, well three of them are sisters to the professors. So, yeah, that'll create conflict. It's just funny that she's a juxtaposition. She plays the long game and she takes advantage of things nicely, but she doesn't seem to want to acknowledge her one, her greatest obstacle. She's just a kid. She's a kid and no one's going to trust her with that level of responsibility. Oh, true that, true that. I mean, Twilight, uh, yeah, where is even her logic in this? Like, She's going to get shut down. 
It's so obvious, but she doesn't see it, which is kind of strange. But now, the real question is, when did she start being pen pals with Tirek? Was it before or after? I'm pretty confident it was before because it seems like she's always had a goal in mind. And I'm not I'm gonna say that she used T Rec more than he used her. Which leads me to believe she initiated the contact. Somehow. Maybe there's a very unscrupulous delivery mayor. It feels that way because the way that T Rec was talking about her pen pal was um she was looking for power and something like that, and he just gave it to her. Was it something like that? Well, basically, she had all these questions about utilizing magic, and he had nothing better to do. Yeah, that makes sense then. Like, yeah. Out of all the villains that we had before, from Nightmare Moon, Queen Chrysalis, Sombra, T-Rex, the Dysodils, uh, Storm King, and Cozy, like, how was Cozy in terms of villainy? Not a physical threat, but I'd argue one of the more cunning. Possibly more cunning than Chrysalis. Mostly because I found Chrysalis's plan had a lot of almost as many holes as her body. Oh, so true. But I, I think Cozy is a legitimate threat. I'd like to know more about how she got this way, but I enjoy her for the surprising menace she can show. Mm, that... Even though I knew she would be trouble, I loved seeing her frown and and have the the vain bulging <laughs> angry face. Oh, yeah, so true. <laughs> Like, the animators are on a kick with that one. But at the same time, too, man, like, Cozy, when you compare her to... Okay, Cozy does not have the same menace as T-Rex. It's not as scary as Nightmare Moon. And so on. You know what I mean? Like, she she does, she does doesn't have that level. I mean, if you compare her to the Dazzlers, I, I still feel the Dazzlers are still a big threat on their own. Like, they have those siren powers. Yet Cozy has nothing. She has only her wits. And you have to respect that. I do. And then should we give at least a mention to Chrysalis? Who? Queen Chrysalis? Who? Uh, well, she's certainly not a queen anymore, is she? Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, what can I say, man? I mean, even the, even the mean six are pl- plotting to overthrow her. Like, what? She's tampering with magic now she doesn't understand, which makes her, I'd argue, a greater threat, though not by intention. She's just very dangerous and because of uh, her lack of awareness and hastiness. But she's all, we also see sort of the weakness she needs someone to blame. Even when it all goes wrong, she still says it's all everyone else's fault. True, 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 true. But still, man, like, Chrysalis in... <laughs> oh, man. Talk about throwing a red herring at us. Because, personally, I felt that Chrysalis was going to be the main antagonist for this season. Uh, we we're going to see her uh, come back with a vengeance and take Starlight down and stuff. But no, no, no. Uh, that that um, that goes too cozy. And I, I don't blame DWK for this because... It was set up there, like, uh, get in, get close to Twilight, um, create a plan, and take over the school and whatnot, and transform, ha-ha, but no, 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 it's cozy, what? It would be funny if she wanted to become an alicorn like Twilight, just have, get enough friends and Celestia shows up. I mean, sorry, I'm still thinking of cozy later. Yeah. But, because uh, really it's the same thing, get, get into the school, get close to Twilight, yeah, true, true. Yeah, but that's the thing. I mean, with Cozy, right? Her end game was get power via friends because friendship is power, and friendship is control. Oh, sorry, magic is control. Her end game wasn't to become an Elercorn or whatnot. Her end game was to be powerful via friendship. I mean, Sunset Shimmer's end game was. Make me an alicorn. You showed me my future. I want to be an alicorn. Nope. Okay, I'll go back. I'll go to this alternate universe and drag them to create an army of teenage zombie soldiers. What? In fairness, Sombra had a similar plan. He just axed the teenagers. Yeah, true that. And it works. It works. It worked. I'd say it worked better without the teenagers. Yep, it worked twice. 
But I, I like checking in on Chrysalis and just seeing how much her mind has has gone far afield. Uh, but we will. I I I think we'll get more of Chrysalis in season nine, because season nine's opener is a uh, whoopa, whoopa doopa. So okay, um, we've gone long. So what do you have to say about Cozy Glow? Man? She's she is menacing. <coughs> Excuse me. She is menacing. She's a lot of fun to watch. She seems blind to the biggest obstacle is her age. And she has no way around that. And that's probably her main failing is she could have, heck, even if she found a brainwashing spell uh, to use someone else to act on her behalf, that would have been quite terrifying as well. True, but the problem is she's a pegasi. Hey, pegasi can brew potions. Uh, true that. True that. So, anyway, uh, she's a lot of fun. I understand that people might not be able to connect because we know so little about her or because the idea of a filly being this dangerous can seem utterly ludicrous. Mm, True, true. Maybe part of that fun is the silliness of the situation, especially when Twilight says, oh, our students will never be able to handle Cozy Glow. (laughs) Yes, the yak that likes to smash things can't possibly handle a filly. Yep. One belly flop from Yona, and it's over. Yep. I'd actually like to see that in slow-mo. Just, uh, you know, orchestral music is playing. Uh, Yona is falling in slow motion, and Cozy's go going, no! Oh, and then uh, in the background, O2 Joy is playing. Or the, uh, six, what is it, the 16th Overture? da 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 boom da 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 Yep. No, but yeah, for, okay. For me personally, cozy here is it's menacing. She's, I won't say she's badass, but written the right way, she can be very menacing. She's manipulative. She's, she's really bad, and you you want to see more out of her because she is a mean character. She's really mean. She's she's all my she's all, um, uh, how to say, she, she's she's nice. She be your friend and whatnot. She's all cutesy, but in the end, she takes a knife and stabs you. Ugh. Well, that's part that's part of what makes her a menace. True that. And we'll see if that menace carries forward in season nine. Yep, true that because when we review season nine, that's going to be something else. So anyway, um, silver, um, what are we going to do for well? Next week's episode. Well, maybe it's time just to touch briefly on the IDW comics again, since we mentioned Ah, it. Uh, MLP number 65, where Celestia goes for a stroll as General Joe Q. Public. Yay! Much awesomeness. Oh, man, that that is going to be fun. Oh, this reminds me. I I say this a lot, but that reminds me of a fan fiction. Yep. Oh yes, I actually know the fanfic. You, I think I know the fanfic to which you're referring. Yeah, I'm not mistaken. I showed it to you, right? Probably. Yeah. And um, this fanfic was it me that told you about it, or was it the whole fandom? I think it was you. Oh really? No. Okay, cool. But well, did you get a chance to read it? Yeah. Oh, cool. Uh, well, let's put that aside and talk about it in that episode. Yeah, there's a lot of fun. Yay! Much awesomeness. So yeah, um, next week we'll be reviewing that much awesomeness much awesomeness so anyway if you have any questions concerns or suggestions for the show you can contact us at themgmail.com you can also reach us on the twitter the show's twitter account is at the MBS show and my personal twitter account is at norman sanzo silver where can the good people find you well on may 17th through the 19th you can find me at everfree northwest as i attend a convention in seattle but you can always find me on the twitters under mlp silver quill same on Deviant Art. You can find me on uh, YouTube by doing a search for After the Fact or Silver Quill. My name should pop up somewhere. And every Wednesday, you can find me on Equestria Daily doing either a new comic review, a retro comic review, or a editorial. An editorial. Should be clear on that. Grammar is important, ladies yeah. and gents. Yeah, yeah. My awesomeness. That'll be cool. Yeah. So, yeah, if you're going to EFNW, right? Yes. Yeah, if you're going to EFNW, make sure to visit Silver. Say hello. Say, hey, man, I like your work. Woo! 
and also silver. If I'm not mistaken, you're catching up on the uh, what should we call this Game of Thrones? Oh yes. Well, uh, by the time folks hear this, I should have seen the the battle episode. Much funsies, much funsies. Yes. Yay. <laughs> So, yeah, uh, talk to him about it. Maybe you guys can catch up on stuff. Yay. And also, please subscribe and rate us on iTunes, YouTube. Don't forget to press the bell icon to stay up to date. And Stitch Radio and also like our Facebook page. You can also catch us on PonyvoLive.com. Links are in the show notes. If you would like to support the show, you can do so at Patreon.com slash the MBS show. With every support, you get a week's early access to review and discussion podcasts exclusive and deleted content and a huge thank you from me talking about the thank yous I would like to thank Amy Lucky Knight Tristan Starstream Jeffrey and also Master of Black thank you so much guys you're great anyway I have been Roman Sanzo I am Cecil Vaquil and we'll guys catch you next week with another fun episode of the MBS show see ya adios Season it was good. I think so. Yay! Season it was good. Yeah, everyone everyone has different opinions, but I I still think nostalgia can can influence us, and that's why we review it. There we go.